What a splendid oxymoron we make, gay Catholics. Sometimes I think to myself in bed at four in the morning in the promised land, sometimes I think I'm sorry to be giving up being a leper, being a publican, being a whore, being the woman at the well, the woman at the well, being a Samaritan. There was great wisdom in being able to be the outsider. You know what I'm saying? And, and a great possibility for compassion for others who are on the outside. As we start becoming Iowa, I don't want to lose that sense of being the outsider. I want to be a Canaanite with Jesus. I want to be the stranger in the crowd. I fell in love with Jim because he was a Samaritan. He was the good Samaritan. We were both ministering to a friend of ours who had a terrible, terrible time at the end, dying of AIDS. And his, this man's right leg had become so uh, wounded and, and diseased. The stench of it was overwhelming. Like nothing, I've smelled corpses, but nothing like this. Anybody, the nurses at, at, at uh, St. Mary's Hospital wouldn't even change the, the dressing at the end. So there, of course, was Jim. I was gagging, and Jim was doing what good Samaritans do. It's like being married to St. Francis. <laughs> I tell you, I, I had this sympathy for, for Claire, you know. Um, <laughs> We're, we're walking along a beach somewhere and, and he's in the south of France and he sees a wounded uh, bird and the whole day comes to a stop. We have to find a place to take the wounded bird. The bird doesn't even want us to hold it. He starts biting me. <laughs> Every time I look at Francis, I think of Jim and I think, it is not easy to be married to that. <laughs> Jim used to own, I, I told this story at the call to action. It's a true story about Jim. He was horrified that I told it to them. I'll tell it to you. <laughs> Tough luck, Jim. Um, my, my lover. He, um, he used to own a bookstore over on Tillman Place, which is a little alley off of Grant Avenue. It's a really good bookstore. He used to have very, very good customers. The Amazon didn't kill us. It was that readers died off. We, we, didn't, we didn't have the same readers. Um, we used to have wonderful readers. It was a carriage trade bookstore downtown, and there was old women who would come in who didn't go to college, but they were socialites, uh, old society dames, and they would read very widely um, French history books, Japanese horticulture. The, gra the daughter who went to college went to a terrible place like Wellesley. She, she, she would come, she'd come in and she would read only British mystery novels. Like the granddaughter who, who didn't even who went to Stanford, uh, even a more dreadful place. She didn't she didn't even read British mystery novels. She would come in and buy at Christmas time these picture books like Bruce Weber and his dogs. And, like. <laughs> anyway, the old lady died and the, the bookstore died. But before the bookstore died, Jim helped it along. There was a, a man, a panhandler, who found Jim, um, and I mean found Jim, um, and his name was Mr. Phil. And Mr. Phil would come in all hours of the day asking for money. And Jim, contrary to what I had suggested, uh, kept giving it to him. And uh, Mr. Phil's mother was always dying. And Mr. Phil needed uh, a ticket on Southwest for $249. I remember the price because Mrs. Mr. Phil's mother died several times. <laughs> Anyway, at the end, the bookstore closed, but Jim kept in touch with Mr. Phil. And then Mr. Phil got very sick uh, from needles, from AIDS, I think. And then at the very end, he was at the Veterans Hospital here in San Francisco. And there were only two people who went to go see him, Jim, of course, and this wonderful uh, sister, um, Sister Anne, from my parish, St. Dominic's, who is truly, truly, the model for Jim and for my life, 
who has seen everything. In any case, one day, uh, Mr. Phil was dying. True story. And Mr. Phil is asking Jim, why have you been so good to me? And Mr. Phil has this dialectic with himself. At first I, he said, I thought it was because you wanted drugs. And Jim said, no, I didn't want drugs. And then Mr. Phil said, I thought, I thought you wanted sex. And Jim smiled and said, no, I, I didn't want sex with you, Mr. Phil. And then Mr. Phil said, and now I realize what you wanted. The reason you were so good to me was because of Jesus. The irony of the promised land is that the church that taught me to love tells me that it is not love that I feel in the morning at four in the morning at the American Colony Hotel. It is a vanity. It is a lifestyle. So many, so many gay friends of mine did not find Jim, did not find their partner. Some of the brightest people I know, the most gifted, could not find each other. It is one of our little tragedies. So many of us do not die married, appealing for marriage. So many of us do not think of ourselves in those terms. It is a great gift to have found a partner, a lover, to have found one's way through this forest, this homosexual forest. I said to my confessor, a Dominican priest, when I was facing very serious cancer four year, five years ago, this month, I said to him, confessing my first confession, bless me, Father, I have not confessed for 34 years. I said to him, I don't think I can confess to you that I'm gay. He said to me, I don't want you to confess that. I said to him, it is in being gay that I found out what it means to be in love. What, I, what, it, found, what, I, what it means to love, to love another person more than myself. And he said to me, he who was given his life to silence and celibacy said to me, I envy you. Thank you very much.